Good evening. My name is Pastor Milos from Arveda Adventist Church, and you're watching Inner Peace Ministries TV program. Patience. None of us really has it. It's a gift that all of us need, but a lot of us lack. It's just the culture we live in. Instant gratification. I want it all and I want it now. Nobody likes waiting. And probably the hardest thing is waiting for God. When is God going to do what he promised that he is going to do? Tonight, I would like us to talk a little bit about that. I would like us to open the Bible and from some uh, biblical stories and uh, life experiences learn how to wait for God and how to understand his timing. Before that, uh, I would like to ask you to give us a call. We are giving away this free book. The book is called Experiencing God's Love. If you are in need of understanding God's better, if you feel that God doesn't care for you as much, you need to read this book. It's going to help you understand him and learn about his character the way he really is, and it's going to help you develop your relationship with him. Also, you can call this number for a prayer if you're in need uh, to talk to somebody or if you just need somebody to pray for you, feel free to call. Our volunteers would love to pray for you. For more of our messages, you can go to YouTube and uh, check our YouTube channel and over there you will find more of similar programs and materials that will help you grow your faith. God's promise written in Genesis chapter 25 is a perfect place to start talking about waiting for God. Isaac, Abraham's son, gets married and his wife, unfortunately, can't have kids. And uh, of course, they want to have kids, so Isaac decides to pray and ask God to open the womb of his wife so he can have kids. And then the Bible says what happens. Verse 19, the Lord answered Isaac's prayer and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to ask the Lord about it. What is this happening to me? Rebecca does the right move. She sees that there is something really weird happening and she goes to the Lord because he already proved faithful to her and she's asking, what's going on with me? And then the Lord answers her and the answer is amazing. Verse 23, and the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other. And the older son will serve your younger son. Now, this was really controversial thing to say. Because at those times, firstborn son, he had uh, everything. He would inherit everything from his father. And he would, on top of that, also be the spiritual leader of the family. So, in order for this promise to come true, Rebecca knew that some things had to happen. First of all, her younger son had to get the firstborn right from her older son somehow. And then, to seal the deal, he had to get the blessing from her husband Isaac in order for Jacob really to become uh, the fulfillment of this promise. Let's for a second go back to the Bible and see what does the Bible say about God's promises. Lamentations chapter 3 verses 22 to 24. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. They for, therefore, I will hope in him. Malachi 3.6 I am the Lord and I do not change. And James 1.17 Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. When we read the Bible, the Bible is pretty firm about describing God as the one who is faithful to keeping his promises. If he said it's going to happen, 
then it's going to happen. If there is a promise you're holding on to in the Bible that relates to your situation, to your life, but God says, I am going to do that. The other part is when is he going to do that? He has his timing and we have, we have ours. But we know one thing for sure. He is going to fulfill his promises. Now, when we look at Rebecca and Jacob, what did they knew about, about God's fulfillment of his promises? First of all, is just the very birth of, his, of her children. They were fulfillment of God's promise after Isaac prayed. Then she knew the story how her husband, was born pretty much in the same way and even more miraculous considering the fact that her mother-in-law was more than 90 years old. And then Abraham was still alive when she came to the family and she heard a whole bunch of stories about miracles that God performed in Abraham's life. So Rebecca knew very well what is God capable of. And she knew very well that when he says something is going to happen, that is going to happen. Now, we believe in God's promises. We read the Bible and we say, wow, this is a beautiful promise. I'll hold on to it. But the real test comes in the moment when we are about to claim his promises. God said he's going to do it. I think it's about the time for him to do that, but he's not doing it yet. That is the moment when our faith in him is being tested the most. Then we truly show what we believe in. Let me ask you something. Is there a promise you want to claim from God? Is there something you're waiting for him to do? I'll encourage you to call the number on the screen and ask for a prayer. All of our volunteers are spir spiritual people who have their personal relationship with God and they know what does it mean to wait for Him. And they know what does it mean for God to answer a prayer. And they would love to pray for you. So take a minute of your time and give us a call and ask us for a prayer. And we will pray for you. There is an old saying in my country uh, that says, uh, you take care of yourself and then God will take care of you, which makes sense, of course. You can't just sit on the floor, pray, and then wait for God to do something miraculous to change your life. Nothing's going to happen and you will be disappointed. But on the other hand, sometimes we take things into our own hands and we mess up more than imaginable and we go totally opposite direction than where God wanted to take us. The question to answer tonight is, where is that fine balance in between taking things into our own hands and doing our part and letting God do His part? If we answer this question right, our spiritual life and our life in general is going to be much, much easier. So, let's get into it. The first report after the birth of Rebecca's kids describes Jacob going into action. So, his brother is hungry. He came back from working outside and he's starving and Jacob is cooking something in the kitchen. And uh, his brother Esau tells him, give me that food to eat. I'm hungry, I'm going to die. And Jacob's like, oh, yeah, sure, I can give it to you. That's fine. But you know what? Let's make a trade. You give me your firstborn rights. The disappointing thing was that Esau didn't really care for his firstborn rights too much because he figured, ah, who cares? You, you can have the firstborn right. Just give me some food. And that's exactly what happened. And we see the first step in fulfillment of God's promise. Jacob is taking action and he legitimately buys his brother's firstborn right. Whether that was legitimate before God or his father, it's something to discuss. But he try, he's trying to do his part to fulfill God's promise. But now the real test comes. Genesis 27 describes Isaac, their father, as a very old man. 
and he doesn't feel too good anymore. He feels that death is approaching and he wants to give his heritage to his firstborn Esau that he loved by the Bible's words much more than he loved Jacob. And uh, he calls Esau to come to him. And here's what the Bible says. Prepare my favorite dish and bring it here for me to eat. Then I will pronounce the blessing that belongs to you, my firstborn son, before I die. So Isaac wants to seal the deal. He wants to give the blessing to his firstborn. Bible doesn't say if Rebecca shared the promise that God gave her with Isaac or not. But obviously Isaac is very firm on wanting to give his blessing to his firstborn Esau. Tell me something. Have you ever had experience where God always waits for the last moment? I believe that every one of us can share an experience of a last minute God. From some reason, he thinks it's perfectly okay to wait for those last 10 seconds before midnight to step in and change things. And we have to sit there and wait and hope that he's going to do that. It's tough love in a way, isn't it? Why doesn't he just do it earlier? Why doesn't he do it in our own time? But honestly, isn't there a better, better practice for our faith than exactly situations like this? And Bible says that Rebecca and Jacob ended up in exactly situation like this. Rebecca heard what Isaac said and she figured, okay, this is the last moment to help God do something because obviously he didn't do anything until this moment to fulfill his promise. So she moves into action. And that is where the story takes the sad turn. Because she teaches her son how to trick his own father. How to steal something that is supposed to be a gift. And as a consequence of that, Jacob, after that day, never ever, saw his parents again. He was running away as a fugitive from his brother who wanted to kill him. And his life, that was supposed to be a blessing, took a very, very nasty turn and it ended up being completely different than what you would expect from a life of someone who was blessed by God. Have you ever felt that you need to help God? Have you ever felt that God just didn't deliver it in the right way, in the right time, and uh, right now you need to step in and do what He didn't do in time? You need to know God very well in order to be able to discern what are His actions and why are they like that. I'll encourage you to give us a call and ask for a book that I talked about uh, in the beginning of this program. The book, God's Amazing Love, will help you understand why God acts in a way that He acts. Why He waits for the last moment. It will help you understand in your personal experience how to handle those kinds of situations. Give us a call. Ask for a book. It's going to be a blessing for you. Now, it's very interesting how Bible describes a person that uh, is blessed by God. A person that waits for God. Here's the example. If we open Jeremiah, in 29th chapter, Jeremiah writes something really interesting. Verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. This is a beautiful promise. And this promise is something that I'm personally holding on to. 
because I believe that God has an awesome plan for my life. And I believe that God is going to fulfill that plan in the right timing for me and for him. Jacob didn't wait for God to fulfill his plan. Even though his idea, God's idea, was future and hope and everything you're hoping to, what happened to Jacob? Let's fast forward real quick to the end of his life. Genesis uh, chapter 47. Jacob is presented to the Pharaoh by his son Joseph, and Pharaoh now talks to Jacob. Let's go to the Bible. Pharaoh asks him, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my pilgrimage are 130. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. Does this really sound like a fulfillment from Jeremiah's promise? He lived 130 years, and he says, my years are few, I barely had enough years to live, and all of them were difficult. Would anybody like to have a life like that? I wouldn't. But Jacob had it. Let's check another end-of-the-life story from Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. Genesis chapter 25. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years. And he was gathered to his people. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference between end of the life of Jacob and Abraham? In Abraham's life, you can see the fulfillment of God's promise because Abraham waited for God. In Jacob's life, you can, you can see that God wasn't able to fulfill his promise of good future and hope because Jacob couldn't wait for God. I'm not saying that Abraham was perfect. On contrary, he had his share of mistakes and he made some things that he really wasn't proud of. But there is a big difference between Jacob and Abraham. Jacob believed in God. He knew who God is and he knew what was God able to do very well. But... Abraham believed God. And that is enormous difference. Do you trust God to put your life in His hands? Do you trust Him to let His timing lead your life? Are you going to wait for Him? Or are you going to just barge in and do it your way and then hope for the best? There's a pretty cool story I heard recently about one circus acrobat who was really awesome at what he was doing. He would run across that wire on top of the tent like nothing and people were amazed. They would look up and say, wow, you're great. They would applaud. And then one time he wanted to make a special stunt, so he got a wheelbarrow. He put the wheelbarrow on top and he asked the people, do you think that I can go across this wire with the wheelbarrow? And everybody said, yeah, sure you can. I really, really believe you can do it. So he took the wheelbarrow and he just wheeled across the wire. And uh, when he got to the other side, he got enormous applause for that. Then he asked another question. He asked the people, do you think that I could do the same thing with somebody sitting in the wheelbarrow? And again, people said, yeah, we believe. I mean, you did it once, you can do it again. We really believe you can do it. And then Circus Acrobat looked at them and he asked them, okay, who would like to sit in the wheelbarrow? That's where the story ends. That's where sometimes our personal story with God ends. Because we don't dare to sit in His wheelbarrow. We don't dare to give Him the chance to fulfill His promise in our lives. And then we end up with shattered dreams. We end up with uh, pain, broken relationships, we end up where we really didn't want to go. But we didn't give God a chance to do His thing. Jacob had to wait for a lifetime 
to see that for God, it's like this to fulfill his promise. And by the end of the sermon, we are going to open the Bible and we are going to see what did God do in his life to show him how foolish he was to take things in his hands and how easy for God it was to perform his miracle and fulfill his promise. Let's take a second just and go to the New Testament and look at what Jesus has to say about this. He is our biggest role model and he is our biggest teacher and uh, his words are always the words that help us shape our spiritual life the best way. So let's get uh, into Matthew chapter 24. Now, really interesting thing. Uh, Jesus uh, is asking his students, what do you think? Who people say I am? And they say, some say you're a prophet, some say you're this, you're that, Elijah. And then he asks them, what do you say who I am? And then Peter just spits out, you are Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus tells Peter something that I would love to hear him saying to myself. He says, Peter, that's not your knowledge. You didn't hear that from anyone. God himself told you that. Imagine being told by Jesus that you are talking to God directly, that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe Peter, Peter at that moment feels amazing. But then Jesus moves on. He figures, okay, this is the right time to share with my friends and disciples what's going to happen in the near future. So he tells them, okay, guys, listen, when we get to Jerusalem, they're going to arrest me, they're going to crucify me and kill me, but I'm going to raise from the dead. Guess who steps up? Peter jumps in. No, that's not going to happen. There is no way that that's going to happen. And he starts pulling Jesus on the side, telling him, what are you talking about? And then Jesus, <laughs> again, does something really strange. He pushes Peter away and tells him, go away from me, Satan. How can one person be fulfilled with the, filled with the Holy Spirit in one second, and then only a minute later, be the voice of Satan himself. How is that possible? Here is the explanation. Jesus gives the explanation immediately after that. Then Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You are not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering, embrace it, follow me, and I'll show you how. Because self-help is no help at all. But self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. And then Jesus has an awesome punchline. He says, what kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? We tend to forget that God can fast forward today's day and see what's going to happen tomorrow. And he already knows what is the best plan for our life. And he wants to fulfill that plan in the best way. In one moment, Peter was there listening to God and God talked to him. In the other moment, Peter disagreed with the idea that God is giving him. He decided to go his own way. That was the moment when Satan took over. Don't let Satan took over, take over your life. If you rely on God's promise, then let him fulfill them in the way that he said that he will fulfill them. And he will. And here's the example. Let's finish up. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 8, the very end of Jacob's life. Joseph is bringing his two boys to his father who is sitting over there. He's tired. He doesn't see well. He doesn't hear well. And he's bringing his boys so his father could bless them. And uh, Joseph takes his firstborn and he puts it next to Jacob's right hand. And he takes his younger son and he puts him right next to Jacob's left hand, waiting for Jacob to bless them. You know what Jacob does? Let's read the Bible. But Israel 
crossed his arms and put his right hand on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, the firstborn. And then he blessed them. So Jacob is sitting over there, old, tired, blind man, and instead of blessing kids like this, he blesses them like this. There was no bit more bitter lesson in the Bible than this one, from my perspective. Jacob, at that moment, knew that God could have done the same thing some century ago, and his life would be completely different. Joseph thought that there was a mistake. Joseph thought that something uh, happened. His father just didn't figure out what's going on. So he tried to fix that, and he says, no, no, father, this is the firstborn. Jacob stopped him and told him, no, my son, I know what I'm doing. Guys, God knows what He is doing in your life. He knows where you are. He knows what you're capable of. He knows how to shape your life in a way that is going to be a blessing for you to live it. But if we stand in God's way, He will never be able to fulfill His promise of future and hope if we try to do things our own way. Here is the biggest difference, and I want you to remember this. If you don't remember any of this sermon, please remember this. God wants us to take action. But the moment our action is going to defy His laws, is going to break the character of Jesus that is supposed to be visible in us, it's going to hurt somebody, or simply be bad. That is the moment when we need to stop and say, this is not the way to go. Take courage and trust God and let Him handle your life. And He will do some amazing things. Stick to Him. Ask Him for a blessing. Read the Bible. Find the answers and He's going to give it to you. Just please, don't run ahead of Him. It's going to be a painful experience that we usually regret. May God bless you in this week to live a life following Him.